An odd job in person. The wandering preacher, huh? I love it, man. <laughs> yeah, I figured uh, since y'all had fun nicknames, I would get one too. <laughs> that is fantastic. So we're we're ready to to be taken home with some really good content. We've talked a lot about uh, threat modeling, building a SOC, doing incident response and forensics, protecting the Windows environment. And, and now it's to you for, for patching, right? One, one of the most important things people have said for a while, well, just patch it. Well, that's easy to say, but it's hard to do at enterprise scale. And it's even harder if you're including more than just the Windows box that uh, is in front of you. Exactly. And uh, just to kind of touch, there's been a lot of great talks here. <laughs> a lot to live up to with Alyssa getting that whole wonderful video <laughs> introduction. Yeah. I don't have anything like that for for my introduction, but I do have a I do have a little cute gimmick to my presentation, so hopefully uh, people enjoy it. But yeah, to be the last person to kind of close us out as far as talks go, that's a uh, it's a lot of pressure here. Let's see if we can uh, see no if we pressure. can do this. Share the screen. You got it. I can there be like go. in a world. <laughs> Oh, hey, I don't even have to share my screen because guess what? Nice. My camera is my screen. <laughs> and uh, so speaking of which, I would like you to take a look at these two wonderful houses here. And kind of a slide title here is Times Change and So Must We. Kind of as you're in a pandemic, as you do, you may get on Zillow and actually try looking at other houses. <laughs> Does your house know you're looking at other houses? You, you may actually start looking at, oh, yeah, what, what are the different houses? If I were to move, what would I want to have? And as you kind of see really old houses on Zillow, like from 1920 or 1910, sometimes even 1890, you see some people who put in hard work to either modernize or you see people who have taken hard work into their hands to actually bring back the, uh, the actual house to what it used to be and bring it back to its former glory with all the lack of accoutrement it had before. But it got me thinking, you know, as, as you look back through how houses have looked and what houses have needed to be in the past, you really see a change of our expectations of housing. You know, we have that log cabin there, and I'll zoom in on that again. You have that log cabin there off to the left, and that's literally just long, you know, trunks of wood that are stacked on top of each other. And then they have some mud and clay and, and uh, straw to kind of chink and daub that up to, to solidify and kind of use as mortar between the wood. And it's one room. You can see it has some uh, windows. So maybe you can have some air conditioning because you got cross breeze going on. You got your fireplace for your heat, your stove, your oven. So you got a lot of interesting things going on here. but. This is not what you would expect to have at a bare minimum in a house today. But back in the frontier of the 18th century, uh, that's everything you need at a minimum to have your house today. But most of us would agree that the house on the right is kind of more towards our bare minimum of what we would like to see in a house today. And so along with that, I am going to be discussing have we been patching our vulnerability management programs as we have, as that practice has aged, as the threats have aged, and as our enterprises have moved on to uh, greener pastures of uh, computing and information technology? I want to thank everyone at the Blue Team Roundup here. This has been a really fun, exciting time to hear everyone's talks, to see discussion on Discord, and to just see all the excitement around. The topics at hand. And uh, I'm so honored that uh, I was uh, asked to, uh, to, uh, to lend some thoughts here on vulnerability management. Just a little about me. I am a vul, vul management leader for a Fortune 1000 company with over 10 years of experience at InfoSec. And also I'm a co-founding member and also CEO of Circle City Con. It's a little conference in June that happens right before uh, Wild West Hack and Fest. So if you, if you kind of want a whole marathon of uh, conning in, uh, in, one, uh, in one go, you can, you can check us out and check Wild West Hack and Fest out as well. Uh, you can check out my Twitter, and also I have a YouTube channel called The Glass of OJ, where you can hear and see videos and presentations kind of similar to this, similar ideas, similar advice, uh, if you will. Remember, a, uh, 
Uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but a glass of OJ keeps the adversary at bay. <laughs> All right, enough self-promotion. We're going to talk about vulnerabilities. We're going to talk about what we were doing and what was going on back in 2006 versus what we have and what should be happening in 2021. We're going to talk about building a vulnerability management program without tools. Don't worry, tools come into play, but when you start building, you don't use tools. And also, we're going to discuss then, round everything up and talk about the new bare minimum through all of this. So what is a vulnerability? This is kind of a definitional thing we have to kind of get over. You know, what do we mean when we say risk? What do we mean when we say vulnerability? What do we mean when we say threat? And uh, I have a CISSP book and CISM book you can go read through and see what these are. But I'm going to give you the definitions I'm using and that I like to use as part of programs and you might find useful in your programs as well. An incomplete definition of vulnerability, and this is probably the definition you're going to be used to seeing uh, your stakeholders, your IT counterparts think it is, which is a vulnerability is a missed patch or update to either like the operating system or the software, or it's code that allows misuse or abuse of a system. You know, we talked about threat modeling at the very beginning of the conference with uh, Alyssa Miller uh, giving uh, a wonderful discussion about, about threat modeling. And so even not even just from the design of the code itself, but also the content and how that code is implemented uh, and how that design is implemented through code is important. So that could be vulnerability. And it's got some good stuff in there. Those definitely represent vulnerabilities, but a more complete definition, I'm not proposing it as the complete definition, but a more complete definition is any aspect of configuration, code, or architecture which causes an increased likelihood of a threat event occurring. So that's, so that's a lot more than just making sure you're patched and kind of as Wolf alluded to, a lot of people for vulnerability management, you know, all they do is scream, just patch, just patch. You know, we're just patching, we're just patching. There's a lot more to it in our vulnerability management programs. 15 years ago, yeah, we were, that's probably about all we were doing was just trying to get people to patch. But if that's all you're doing today is just trying to get people to patch, you are, you're a little bit below the bare minimum of what you should probably be getting involved in. Which brings us to a comparison between the years. And uh, our, the conversion to PowerPoint didn't do so well on the uh, year, though. We lost 2021, but I'll, I'll explain what that says in a second. So in 2006, think about what we were doing back then. In 2006, we had basically point-in-time methods of being able to get our vulnerabilities. So these were network scans for assets. In many ways, we were helping the CMDB team determine what assets were actually on the network. Uh, and in fact, even today, uh, that, is a, that is a perfectly great thing to do to help your CMDB team out, which is to go and scan your network for assets that they may not be aware of and they may not be able to scan or track for. We also, you know, credential scans are nothing new. Back in 20, 2006, we were using credential scans to look for mispack missed patches. We were looking for configurations that lend yourself towards, you know, being vulnerable on the box. Also, we were inviting external pen tests and also vuln scanning of our external web front ends, especially to see, to make sure Apache is up to date, Java is up to date, those types of things are up to date, make sure our services are, are not running on the internet that shouldn't be. You know, if you see RDP on the internet, it's probably not a good idea <laughs> to run RDP on the internet or SSH <laughs> or VNC. <laughs> so there's a lot of things to look at from that perspective. We've been doing that for a while, but generally we just get a point in time, usually a month, maybe a quarter, especially for pen tests. Sometimes it's just annually. And sometimes it's scoped down to just one application. It's a long time to wait to uh, you know, go between applications for pen tests. We also would see code review. Code review is nothing new. Code review, you would go and make sure that you're still, you're, you're still looking through the threat models and the patterns that you've done, and to make sure that you're following your patterns, you're following your design principles. 
but also code review would help also see hard-coded credentials. Code review would also uh, maybe show where you're not sanitizing your outputs or you're not validating input so well. So code review would help around cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery. But man, it was a really manual process uh, and not a lot of great automated tools to give you a continuous view. And especially as agile and continuous development has become a thing, especially with DevOps, in pushing code much more frequently, many times a week even, you need abilities to be able to fork right into that and you need abilities to uh, become a part of that process and make the developers a part of your process. So in 2021, so kind of let's go back to that analogy that we had of that house. You know, the, the 2006, I don't want to say it's the log cabin, but maybe it's the uh, Victorian house from the late 1800s, right? You know, it's got a pot belly stove. Uh, it's got an ice box, you know, so we've got some old things there that we don't want anymore. When we go get a house, we want to see continuous refrigeration hooked up to electricity. We don't want to have an ice box, which is a point in time. And then we got to make sure at a later time we put something else into it to make sure it stays cold. We want that continuous refrigeration. We want that continuous assessment, a continuous look at the state of our vulnerabilities. And so in 2021, the, the theme really here is continuous. And that's what's under that 2021 there, continuous as opposed to point in time. The manual point in time assessments, those can still have value, especially if you need quick answers on something that can give you great value. But as far as running a program and running something that's valuable to your business and can give you decision-making power daily, you need continuous assessments, which means your tools need to be fashioned towards that. Really gone are the days where you can just take up an in-map scanner and just go in-map scan things and call that vulnerability management. You could maybe call it part of a vulnerability assessment one point in time, again, going back to point in time, but you need tools that are automated. And sure, you could go through the time it takes to develop your own tools. And in some cases, you may find if you have millions of servers, maybe you actually do have to develop your own vulnerability management tooling. But if you're the average enterprise, these things are fairly commodity these days for the network scan, the credential scan, the infrastructure scanning. It's fairly commodity. It's very bare minimum, below bare minimum even. It's foundational. You already have that. So these are on the shelf. Just take it off the shelf. You don't need to build that part from scratch. So when looking at system hardening assessments, we can get into checklists on how our systems should look and be configured. And you can assign criticals, highs, mediums, lows to failures on those audits. So if some, you know, if I don't know what it could be, maybe on an endpoint, you want to make sure autoplay on your USB drives isn't enabled. <laughs> maybe that's a critical on the, on the manufacturing floor. Maybe it's not so critical in uh, salespeople's machines as they're going out and selling things. But you, you would be able to rank those as well. You need to be able to rank those and, uh, and, and get some intelligence on that. We also have containers these days. And you'll notice the next few things on the slide here entail cloud. And it's really interesting from 2006 to 2021, the, the move to cloud has really changed vulnerability management and should really change vulnerability management. Because as, as we went from physical servers and we went into virtual machines, that was still on-prem technology. We were still very comfortable with it. It's just virtualization. We can handle that. We still do network discovery. We still do credentialed. Oh, but now the virtual machines are in IA, IAAS. So now we don't manage the hypervisor. That's Microsoft, that's AWS. We got that shared responsibility model that I'm sure you've seen in a lot of different other charts, but we still manage the VM. So we're maybe not doing our network scans up in the cloud anymore. Now, maybe we have an agent on there to do our vulnerability scanning. Maybe we're doing a credentialed scan up there instead for, for some of those systems. So that's how we're gonna get that, great. Well, the web developers tell you, not so fast. We're not doing virtual machines anymore. No, 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 no. So we've taken care of you, uh, vulnerability management. We're now in containers. So don't need to worry about vulnerabilities because you know we're in containers now. So you know the threat's pretty low, right? Well, there's 
as several people on Twitter who love escaping out of uh, containers can tell you, yeah, that's still running on a VM. You just gave that VM to somebody else like AWS or Microsoft to manage. Now you're just running a container, an instance of your application on top of it, essentially. So you still have that container image, you have the build process, and you also still have the code. Unfortunately, what happened is we started moving towards that and then function as a service, as we started moving further away from being able to have visibility into the infrastructure running our code, a lot of vulnerability management programs haven't caught up to shifting their gaze or expanding their gaze into running more towards the code side of application security and vulnerability management in general. And so you also, so, so you have that issue where, you know, you can stay just on the network and just kind of deal with what you've got and be like, all right, so we just got rid of half of our issues. So now these, these are the issues I can shine a light on. When what you should really be doing is saying, nope, now, we, now we've got more time, more energy and resources. We now need to take a look at what the business is doing here and incorporate that into our monitoring. And again, it needs to be continuous. You also have SaaS applications. Those are, those are kind of hard to do simply because uh, as the application, a SaaS application owner like Box, or it, it could be any number of, uh, if you're in health, maybe it's maybe you have a health records uh, SaaS application. They probably haven't given you permission to just go scanning, but there are tools out there that can do continuous monitoring and uh, do indeed take a look at what's publicly available on those things. So are you doing that? Are you taking a look at advantage of those types of tools? You may have hosting providers that, again, it's kind of quasi cloud. They're, they're providing all these servers for you to put your application on but they're going to manage that server. They're going to manage the infrastructure. They're going to manage the load balancers in front of it. You know, whatever, whatever have you, they're just providing you a place to plant your application. What do you do with hosting providers? You know, you might have to think, do we just have to have a plan for, you know, just monitoring bad stuff that comes through that affects things over there that we know. So if a new vulnerability comes out that everyone says we must patch now, you know, can you reach out to those hosting providers and say, hi, can, are you planning to patch those particular things? You know, because we know you have them or do you have them? Case in point is SolarWinds. Uh, when the SolarWinds happened, one of my pieces of advice I gave people was talk to your third parties that have, in, you know, access into your systems, especially MSPs or hosting providers that you have hosting some of your, your applications because, you need to get some information from them. Are they using SolarWinds to manage your app or infrastructure in any way? Maybe they're doing it for other customers. What's your exposure? So even just getting some of those things are things you know, we definitely have in 2021. It's hard to get continuous on that one. And then some things are just gonna belong to third-party risk. And so that's something that they work with vendors on and that's, that's over in their area. I haven't seen too many vulnerability management programs that own third-party risk, but it probably exists out there. But maybe that's a part of your tool set you need to have is the ability to work with third parties and vendors and become a part of that process. So that's a lot. 2021, we're doing a lot now. We're doing a lot more than we were back in 20, uh, 2006. So this slide here, we're gonna just look at what are we doing when we're building from scratch? And this will help you inform if you just need to patch instead of build from scratch your program. You just need to patch your program. This will give you some insights on where maybe you need some patching or shoring up in your vulnerability management program. So we're going to start building without tools. First and foremost, in my opinion, is governance first. This is the non-sexy part of vulnerability management, a lot of people call it. This is not the technical bits that we kind of fawn over and really love to get involved with, but it's honestly some of the most critical parts of vulnerability management because governance, when you have your government's governance <laughs> uh, laid out first, that means you've got policies and you have standards. Policies is basically the business indicating these are the activities we're going to have, or we will have a vulnerability management program. The standards then are going to tell you, here's how the vulnerability management program is going to operate at a very high level. And so you need to have those types of documents in first, but probably most important, and some of, some of the, uh, I think the previous speaker was talking about this too, 
is your stakeholders and people you need to interact with. It is very important you get stakeholders on board with your vulnerability management program for a lot of reasons. Number one, it just makes it easier to do business because everyone's in agreement that XYZ needs to happen. But number two, you are not responsible, usually, you're not accountable or responsible for the enterprise patching or fixing vulnerabilities. That's not what your job is as a vulnerability management leader, most of the time. Depends on how you design it. But if you're gonna design a vulnerability management program, not a patch management program, then you are not accountable for that. You are accountable for measuring, monitoring, and prioritizing vulnerabilities in the environment, assessing that versus your prioritization scheme, your risk portfolio, your profile, the context of your business, and then uh, sending in remediation requests to the appropriate people to get things remediated to put your to, to really reduce that likelihood of exploit. That's what we're trying to do at the end of the day, is we're trying to reduce that likelihood of exploit. So these are your key partners, really. These are the heads of information technology or the heads of business that essentially run the various servers, services, and applications out there. So if you're in a manufacturing environment, it could be your, your manufacturing and OT IT people, your sales IT people, your commercial IT people, your corporate kind of data center IT people, the, uh, the end user compute IT folks, Sometimes cloud is separated out from that and they have their own IT structure. There's, and you may have, you may also have uh, subsidiary companies that you have to work with. And so you have groups there. So you might need to invite them into this governance structure as well. These people are folks that you're going to need buy-in from. You're going to need to design processes that work for them and with their current processes or help them design new, new processes to process your requests and uh, your demands, so to speak. And when you do that, what you're doing is you're giving them accountability over what they have. It's up to them to maintain patching. It's up to them to administer and maintain the system. At the end of the day, the accountability is at that IT director level. And then they have people under them who are the hands-on keyboard. They're the folks who actually are responsible and are going out there and uh, going through and doing the hard work of patching, tracking down owners, you know, working with devs to make sure that holes are plugged in the code or that mo you know, code is modified in such a way or that dependencies are, are updated at the first, second, and even third level. <laughs> Dependency hell gets really terrible. But if you've got these partners in IT, if you've got these partners that you can work with, it makes, the, it makes it a lot easier and it also gives them a sense of ownership in vulnerability management. And also they become your champion with the business partners themselves. So the, biz, the actual parts of business. So now you're talking about the manufacturing site leaders that are creating a certain product or the actual, if your health, maybe it's the, the hospital administrators that you know, your IT leaders are with and talking with a lot. They become your champion then, and they get to say, hey, you, were, <laughs> you remember that one vulnerability from way back, or you remember seeing that, that news article, and I told you we needed to take down these certain, these certain things you know, three months ago? Well, we did. And thank you for that, because, you know, just a week ago, maybe somebody, maybe somebody was in the news and that was what popped them. And they get to be that champion and they get to take victory and they get to really cheer those wins with the rest of the business. And that's a great thing to have. You will do not underestimate the power of that kind of coalition building to really set your roadmap on, not on fire, but really blaze that trail with your roadmap and, uh, and, and, and get the focus, get the energy going, and the priority with these partners. So that kind of leads into focusing on the business, right? Because these folks are the, the, the gateway to the business. So you need to figure out what your business is doing. <laughs> you know, we're all in information security for various reasons. But when you're on the corporate side, when you're actually on the blue team, you have to take an interest in the business. You have to take an interest in what it is we're actually trying to do here. You know, 
if you're at a hospital or part of a massive health company, maybe it's you take a tour of the operating rooms or some of the labs or some of the places where, you know, real healing is done and medicine is practiced and you see what's at stake. You see really the impact of of what a threat could really do to this environment. And also, if you push too hard on certain vulnerabilities being patched, you know, maybe you could have an impact as well in that you patch too quickly or you told someone to close a hole too quickly without testing. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe something kinetic ends up happening. That's not a good thing. That can happen in manufacturing. It can happen in health. It can happen in a lot of places. It can happen in water treatment facilities. There's a lot of safeguards in some of those places, but, you know, you want to make sure that you've got the credibility there. And so part of that building that credibility with the business is getting to know the business and getting to know what's at stake, getting to know what their cares are, what they really are trying to accomplish, and then trying to partner with that mission, trying to partner with that and make your vulnerability management hang off those values and and those goals that they have. Once you focus on the business, figure out how they're doing it too. You know, are they using IoT? Are they in is that stuff connecting to the cloud? Are they using a lot of SaaS apps? Are they mostly focused on function as a service? Are they using containers a lot? Do we not have any public IPs and it's just all in the cloud and dynamically assigned? You know, how are how are they accomplishing what they're doing? What are these applications? What are the systems they are on? And how are they accomplishing what they're accomplishing? Because then that's going to tell you what you should really be scoping in your vulnerability management program. So that brings us to this third point over here, which is to scope and roadmap your program. And also to get very specific, and I'll credit Wolf with this, when you design your program, be specific on what you're not going to cover. What aren't you going to cover? That's as, that's as important as telling telling somebody what you are going to cover. And it makes it even more explicit as to what the goals of your program are and, and what you are trying to accomplish and how you have tailored it to the business. You know, it doesn't make sense necessarily if uh, you don't have a lot of on-prem infrastructure to be doing a bunch of network scans all over the place. Maybe you need to tone down that, that activity. Maybe you need to raise activity with container scanning or the software development lifecycle. Maybe that's where you ought to focus 60, 80% of your energy because that's where the real threats are. That's where the vector is. That's where you're going to see the more likely, the likely threats come through. So build that scope and build that roadmap. And when you do build that scope and roadmap, that then, now this is where the tools come in, this now helps you identify what capabilities you need to accomplish this program, to help support this program. Uh, and before you even get into any scanning technologies that you need, probably the most important tool in your tool chest that you could have for a capability is your central reporting tool. Central reporting tool is the main capability to invest in. And the reason is, is because central reporting tools today did not exist back in 2006 at all. And if you did have some kind of visualizer for your vulnerability management data, it was geared towards one flavor of vulnerability management. There are platforms today and tools today that can take your, your, um, your, your source code scanning, can take your dynamic application scanning scans. It can take your container scans, your, your, your network vulnerability management scans, your system and configuration scans. It can take all of that in and give you one clear view or at least one place to view all of this and also let you get context into those systems and applications, let you group them up and let you really understand where the ownership and accountability for those are to track not only the vulnerabilities, but also the systems. So that makes your remediation easier. A lot of them have remediation capability to where you can send tickets through your favorite ticketing uh, tool and, uh, you can go ahead and send requests to whomever to, to, to take care of things. So they're very powerful tools in reporting. And the reason why I say central 
reporting tool is very important is because some of the capabilities you're looking for actually may already exist in the platforms IT is already using. So I've been seeing a lot of AV engines recently coming out with uh, kind of threat and vulnerability management tool sets. I can think of like three or four off the top of my head. I know Kaspersky's been doing it for a while. I've tried not to name tools through this. Uh, through this, I'm happy to you know, DM me a bunch of tools that are out there that can handle this. But there's a lot of AV or EDR tools that can really help you with some of the missing patches, you know, on systems or software that's out of date that has vulnerabilities associated. Can you pull that information out and put that into your reporting tool? A lot of times you can. Sometimes it might take a little bit of doing, it might take a little bit of scripting or API magic to be able to make that happen. But for the most part, you can take data out of one place, put it in your central reporting tool, and your reporting tool should be able to just do it. Just put these things in their proper place and enrich them with information from your risk department as far as criticality of assets goes and so on. So look for capabilities. Uh, cloud with uh, container scanning. Container scanning exists in Azure and AWS and Google actually. So in Google Cloud, they have container scanning abilities already. So you can actually just scan the images already out of the box and you could probably grab that data and put that into your central reporting tool. And that's great because then the tool is in the hands of IT. They already can see this data as well and they can react to it. But it also, again, gives you that ability to report on it and also issue remediations if they're missing things, if they're not, if they're not keeping up to date or if something new completely unseen before has come up and you need to address that with them. So all of this <laughs> to say, what's the new bare minimum? The new bare minimum for your vulnerability management programs is assessments must be as continuous as possible. The days of just relying on manual assessment tools should be over by now. They're still useful for many things. Uh, if you need to focus in on one particular application or system, there's still a lot of great things. But as far as what you should be doing overall from a vulnerability management perspective, focus on continuous as possible. Results must be prioritized by threat intel and asset context automatically. Oh my gosh, there are tools today that are central reporting tools that already have threat intel built into them as a service. Because what they're gonna do is they're gonna take those vulnerabilities, they already know the exploits that exist for those, not just that there's a Metasploit module, but this is the particular malware and here's an article on it by McAfee or by Semantic or by Sophos. They can go in and uh, they can go in and say, ah, there was a compromise report or a breach report by someone. And sure enough, these were the vulnerabilities involved. And that was just 30 days ago. So this seems to be a campaign that's going on. Maybe you should now prioritize this as a vulnerability, for instance. Here are new exploits in the wild we've been seeing uh, that were in malware reported using these vulnerabilities. So there's all kinds of feeds now that people are just getting. And they can pump these into uh, the tools automatically. Asset context automatically. Get a sense of if this is an external, external asset, if it's internal. You know, if there's a scale for asset criticality, is this the most critical asset out there? Maybe that's a crown jewel business process. Or, you know, maybe it's not something we care so much. Maybe it just regulates uh, lighting or something in a, in a particular room. Maybe we don't care about that too much. So there, there's a way to, to, to start getting context into your business, but also what's coming, what's most likely to come after your business based on those things. Because when you're going through just C CVSS and you're saying, okay, we're gonna take care of the tens. And I have actually run through these tools. If you would have just paid attention to the tens, there's a bunch of mediums that were remote code execution or something else that's being used today in a threat, in a campaign, in new malware that's being released, downloaded via phishing, drive-by browsing, USBs, just all kinds of different things being dropped by malware droppers. Those medium, there's a lot of medium vulnerabilities you would be overlooking, but that you should really prioritize. How would you ever know if all you were doing was just doing what we were doing back in 2006, which was good at the time, 
again, go back to 18th century, that log cabin on the frontier, that's great. That's exactly what you need. Today, we need something better. We need, we need a new bare minimum. And the thing is, is, the great thing is you don't really have to, you don't have to configure hardly any of this. The asset context will require a little bit of configuration and it's literally just sliders. But the threat until that's built in. As soon as you get your, your vulnerability data in there, that's it, you've already got it. It's already done the calculations. It's already said, let's plot, you know, we're gonna apply the, the threat intel to every single one of these findings and it'll go ahead and prioritize for you. Uh, and you can play around with the, the prioritization schemes as well usually. But at a bare minimum, that's what you should be able to do. You should be able to prioritize your results that are gonna end up becoming remediation activity that you send out to your devs, your infrastructure, your DevOps teams, your container folks, you gotta, you gotta be able to do that these days. And again, your reporting tool shouldn't just, shouldn't just do both kinds of music, country and Western. It should be able to, it should be able to take in the different flavors of vulnerability management. So you see, I have a little list there for SAS, DAS, OS scans, containers, et cetera. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you're getting what you need. Always going back to that roadmap, always going back to that governance, getting people on board. But, you know, this is a better winning strategy than just ad hoc trying to do stuff like we were back in 2006 and generating thousand page reports that no one's ever going to read and really ge generate no value, especially today. So th th this is the new better minimum that we have to have. So uh, if you're building something from scratch, Consider these items as a bare minimum. Of course, go back here to, to build your governance first, focus on the business. Maybe you've got some of these capabilities already. Maybe you even have some of the central reporting already in place that does some of this. But did you go back through and take care of your governance? Did you involve, have you involved your stakeholders? Maybe there's parts of the business you don't realize are doing things Maybe they're doing things you're not even aware of. Maybe you have presence in places you're not aware of. You'll never know if you don't engage those business owners, and especially those folks in IT who interface with them. You'll never know. So you need, to, you need to make those people your friends. You need to put them on committees with you, and you need to hand the ownership and accountability of these activities, especially these proactive activities that we try to put in place. You need to hand that over to them and give, enable them and give them that ownership. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of the bare minimum here of building a uh, vulnerability management from scratch or patching your current programs. I hope this was helpful for everybody. And so I guess we, we head to the saloon now, ye old saloon, and uh, we get some questions from people. And uh, yeah. Ye old saloon. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the questions that came in was, um, what are some of the, the tools for doing the centralized reporting you mentioned? Mm -hmm. The big one out there right now that everyone's talking about is Kenna. Hmm. Kenna talks about this a lot. I will say even folks like uh, Tenable and Rapid7, they are getting more diverse in their capabilities for scanning. And they now have a little bit of that threat intel sprinkled in, but they even have more of an asset aware system now that can write on top of that. So they're, so they're starting to develop that capability. They see the, the market for tools like Ken out there and they're trying to compete. There's also, um, there's also RiskSense, which I've used before. And there's probably several others out there that are generating. I'm not even touching the ones that use machine learning. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the bare minimum there. Maybe that's a maturity. If you need to go that route and it proves itself, Maybe that's later on down the line, but the bare minimum where you need to start, this is turnkey. It's like you go into your house, you turn the key, you expect the air conditioning is running. You expect the heater is running. You know, you expect the fridge is not an ice box. <laughs> it's turnkey. It should already be in there. You expect there's a bathroom, not like. <laughs> and and not with like a you. toilet that runs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, welcome to vulnerability management. Please take a shovel. You, uh, Go right over here and start digging, and we'll be with you shortly. <laughs> no, this is so lie down in the really, hole. Lie down in the hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this has been really good. Some of the feedback we had was 
how to prioritize you know vulnerabilities when you do have so much of this is that is non-technical right when you do have to explain it to to your peers when you do have to explain it to um, you mentioned the hospital system right when you've got to to explain why oh we're going to be rebooting a whole bunch of baby monitors uh, so do you do you have any tips on doing that prioritization side yeah i think you know again taking that tour through the baby monitor facility would probably be good first because then you i mean face it we all get an idea we can see what goes wrong really quickly and yes. especially if there's active attack going on in places or we suspect active attack is shortly going to happen explaining to them the kinetic nature what is going to happen what are they going to notice if an attacker actually does leverage these vulnerabilities with exploits what is going to happen in their environment what's going to happen to patients in that particular scenario and this is kind of part of that this is kind of part of healthcare really is making sure your systems are up to date really is part of healthcare and we have to help them understand that you know in order to give good care machines must be you know kept in good order but also the machines themselves don't pose a risk due to some jerk out there going through and uh you know exploiting this and and causing troubles for your environment that also goes to the flip side though is again you need the credibility there so that they know that you're not going to try and get activity on there you're going to go through and do responsible things and recommend testing and and really flesh that out because you yourself could be that could be that risk to a patient or whatever oh, so yeah. you actually the flip side is true that sometimes your remediation activity could represent a risk to the business. And so you need to take time to do your false positive analysis to help the uh, remediation teams test this and monitor and make sure that that works as expected. Get with the vendors, you know, really try to white glove a lot of those types of situations where there's a lot of high stakes. Yes, I, I like the term white glove. You're, you're right in that we could be the risk. I, I know I've shared this story before, but for the entire audience, just to, to, to mention it, the baby monitor story, I was doing vulnerability management for a hospital and I just figured, hey, I'll scan at night. That seems like a good time. This seems like a great subnet. I'll just run the scan across the subnet. And uh, I set it up, I went home, I went to bed. Three o'clock in the morning, it started scanning mm -hmm. and it just so happened to be the NICU. So baby monitor would go offline nurse desk would get an alarm that something's wrong with the baby. They would run to the baby. Thankfully, nothing was wrong. Right. They'd go back, and just by the time they got back, I was scanning the next baby monitor, and that was the night where I killed all the babies. Oh, no. Yeah. You got to <laughs> schedule. And that, again, that's that's where you get to know your, your, your IT stakeholders. They will get you those conversations with the business stakeholders. And again, get you those tours onto those places where you start seeing, yeah, we're gonna need to make sure we really schedule this out. We work with these folks to, again, even, even business owners, give them some of that ownership and account, you know, accountability there to where they're, they feel they're a part of your program because really they, they should be a part of your program. Yes, there's things that we have to do. There's the old security is everyone's responsibility, but we are responsible for carrying out those tasks. But it's nice to it's nice to make them a part of that process and help them understand how you're going to end up helping. They're going to end up helping you. I agree. Such such good advice in terms of partnering the business. Such a strong way to end the uh, the blue team roundup. So I, I really appreciate it. And hey, Shelby Velda, how are you guys? Hello, long time no see. Oh no, it's the deputy. <laughs> <laughs> Better scattle. Watch out, preacher man. <laughs> Wolf. I just want to send out a big thank you. This was an amazing roundup. I'm I'm looking at the audience and and it, nobody dropped off. So, you know what? It's fantastic. The lineup was fantastic. The the talks were fantastic. You're a, a fantastic MC, and the jacket oh. is a hit, by the way. I <laughs> well, thank you so much later. for having me. It's been a lot. Of, it's been a good day. It has been a fantastic day. It, it really has been. I'm, I'm well pleased. Fantastic. I just want to throw out a couple more thank yous. Shelby, thanks as always for, for being 
the person behind the controls, and Ryan, thank you for handling the green room. In Megan, his actual and green room. And of course, Justin, the ranger who we got to see briefly on here. And more than anything, thank you to our nerd herders. Oh, there he is. He's the wild up. Justin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks to our nerd herd herders, you guys really, we couldn't do what we do without you in the Discord, you know, showing those links, you know, answering questions, doing what we need. So really appreciate, really appreciate that. Wolf, uh, I know I'm going to see you at Wild West Hack and Fest in Reno, June 16th through the 18th, and we're super excited. You know, we, we want you on the, we want you to hear more, more often as well. Oh, yeah. Odd jobs are always welcome as well. You will be receiving the Wild West coin for speaking today. So we'll be sending those out, out to you if you haven't seen them. Uh, Wolf, I may hand deliver yours to you in uh, Reno. <laughs> if we don't get it out to you beforehand. But again, we just want to, want to thank you so much. For all your help with this and, and putting this together, you've been amazing. This has probably been one of my my favorite roundups so far. Yeah. So. Yeah, we yeah. just had a, a killer speaker lineup. And, uh, you know, again, from a blue team perspective, I really liked how we were able to show the full life cycle ending up with OJ and doing the, you know, preventative protective measures. So uh, for any of you guys who are on the Discord or new to cybersecurity or considering Red or blue, I hope we've made some uh, some inroads into your hearts to get you over to the blue team. And if not, we will stop you on the red. Yes. <laughs> awesome. awesome, awesome. It's a good thing. Well, um, I guess one last big thank you to all of our sponsors and to all of our speakers today. And again, one big thank you to everyone who joined us to attend. Without you guys, we wouldn't be doing these kinds of events. So, <laughs> somebody say happy hour. Yeah, time to yeah. head to happy hour. I think we did say happy hour. Where's your cocktail? <laughs> I know. I got rid of all the drinks. I have my mocktail. <laughs> five minutes to five. <laughs> it's at least, five at least here it is. <laughs> hey Troy, thank you so much for speaking today too. I was really yeah, no, I was excited to be here. Awesome, yeah. And with the and with the lineup that to be part of it was it was great, fantastic. That's fantastic. Were you part of the news yesterday as well with Ryan? No, I was. You haven't gotten that brave yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's hard. It's hard to do the time slot with the you know, juggling the the work life balance and the children and everything like that, right? So, so yeah, it's hard to to make those time slots right now. I, I, I'll, I'll probably make one here soon. So go over to the Wild West Hack and Fest website. Look at the free webcast we have going on coming up. We are two minutes from the top of the hour here, and I'm sure everyone wants to be able to get out of the office at five if mm -hmm. you're in that time zone. Um, 5 so, a.m., 5 p.m., one of those. <laughs> and happy hour. Don't forget the happy hour. That's right. Don't yeah. forget happy hour. <laughs> Thanks so much again, Wolf. We, we appreciate you. You bet. Cheers, yes. everyone. I we'll look forward to seeing Bye. you in Way West. And thank you again to all our attendees. And we'll see you in the next one. I'm going to disappear again before Ryan starts uh, uh, recording this, because somehow I always end up on the video when I don't want to be. Um, Did you so, see your uh, last cameo? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, the, your jacket looks great, Wolf. Best of luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.